Good grief. Can you believe it? It's Christmas time. <sighs> now, I have to tell you again, this is my favorite little Christmas special. My kids have already had to endure it once. My son went and got it out the video cabinet the other night just because he knew it was the, only, it was the first special we were going to watch. And he also realized we'll probably watch it again on Christmas Eve and maybe three or four times between the two. They roll their eyes at me because when we are going and watching this special, I start reciting the lines with the little cartoon. They're like, good grief. How many times have you watched this thing? You don't really want to know. But I want you to take a deep breath and let it out. This has been a rough year as far as sermons go. I realize we've done some things that have been challenging and sent you home with your toes curled up and some thinking things and all kind of things, but not so much this morning. As a matter of fact, the entire purpose of this sermon is to give you some Christmas encouragement. And it begins with this problem of Christmas pantophobia. Fear. We fear a lot when it comes to Christmas time. Many of us fear going shopping, all the crowds and the pushing and the shoving. Many of us fear not getting our shopping done because we hate to go shopping. Some of us fear that we won't be able to get together with family, while others of us fear that, well, we'll get to get together with family too much. Some of us fear travel. Some of us fear during this time being lonely. Did you know that's one of the biggest problems with Christmas is loneliness? And you're probably thinking, well, if this is your idea of encouragement, then you stink at it. Well, just give me a few moments. Because here's what you need to know about this idea of Christmas pantophobia. What did Lucy say Christmas pantophobia is? It's the fear of everything. Now, I like charged salts, and I, and I like this particular cartoon, but they really should buy a dictionary. Because you know what? Lucy's got the wrong definition. Pantophobia, if you look it up, is lacking fear. Having no fear... It also means an abnormal fearlessness. -ness. Fearless, yeah, that's right, fearlessness. There you go. Some definitions even say it means absolute fearlessness. Now, we've met kids that have this, this desire, this lack of fear gene. They're the crazy kids that jump off the buses while they're still moving. You know, those kids, they, they lack this fear gene and they are completely fearless. But you know, in biblical terms, there's another way that we could define the word pantophobia. It could be fear not. Aha. Now, there is a phrase when you tie it in with Christmas, as they say, that'll preach. It really will. This idea of fear not is found all the way through the Christmas story, all the way from the beginning to the end. So here's our encouragement this morning. We're going to walk through the Christmas story, and I am going to give you reasons that you should not be afraid of Christmas, nor of life in general. Just general encouragement. And so this morning we're going to begin in Luke chapter 1, verses 12 through 13. Now, I'm going to give you a moment to go ahead and get toward Luke. We're going to be in the Gospels. We'll bounce around to a couple of little scriptures, but we'll be over there. So go ahead and make your way to Luke chapter 1. That's Matthew, Mark, Luke, right there at the beginning. And we're going to begin at the very beginning of the Christmas story, which is not usually where we pick up the story. We're going to pick it up in the temple. Then the angel of the Lord appeared to him. Now, him is Zechariah, a priest standing at the right side of the altar of incense. When Zechariah saw him, he was startled and was gripped with fear. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah. Your prayer has been heard. Your wife Elizabeth will bear a son, and you shall call him John. And so the first reason that we see that we're not supposed to be afraid is God has heard our prayer. Now, that in itself kind of should relieve some tension in your life. Because let's face it, sometimes we think we call and we get God's answering machine. You know, leave a message and I'll get back to you as soon as I'm done solving all the important problems in the world. Keep in mind, Zachariah was a senior citizen at this point. 
And he had probably stopped praying for what he was about to receive many moons ago. They were praying for a child. And I just don't know very many senior citizens that would sit down today and say, God, could you bless me with a child? It's just not happening. You don't ask for those kind of things when you're 50, 60, 70, 80 years old. It's just not on your list of Christmas lists. It just doesn't happen. So, so he had probably long since stopped praying for this, but it says God has heard your prayer. That relieves some fear. God's listening to what you have to say. And you know what? Because God has heard your prayer, you know what? There's some mercy in your life. Psalm chapter 6, verse 9 says, The Lord has heard my cry for mercy. The Lord accepts my prayer. Those pleas that you put up in those darkest hours, when your life is falling all apart, when things just aren't going the way that you think they should, when you think there's no way heaven could possibly even know I'm a, I exist, let alone listen to my prayer, it says in those moments, God grants mercy. And not only does God grant mercy, well, it says that there is love in the fact that God listens to your prayer. Psalm 66, 20 says, Praise be to God who has not rejected my prayer or withheld his love from me. You know, kids get a better understanding of this than we do. And I don't mean grown-up kids, I mean little kids. Because little kids are always looking for to be accepted by their parents. And sometimes as a little child, you have a very hard time getting your grown-up parents' attention. Sometimes you do things just to get their attention. Things that are not so good, just to see if they're paying attention to you. But here's the thing that a child looks for most. They're looking for love. They're looking for your attention because they need to know that you love them. Even if it means sometimes they're getting disciplined because you love them, they need to feel that love. This idea that God hears your prayers, that God is listening to you, that God is paying attention to you, that you have God's undivided attention. Man, what fear does that relieve? You think about the little child that is going through so much struggle in their life, and when their parent is there, that fear goes away when they're nestled up against mom, or dad is there providing some encouragement and strength. That's what God does for us when he just simply hears our prayer. There's another reason that we're not supposed to be afraid. If you turn over, you stick right there in Luke and you turn just a few more verses in Luke chapter 29, verse 30, we find Mary entering into the fear thing. It says Mary was greatly troubled at his words. This is his words being Gabriel. And wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. The angel seems to think that Mary should not be afraid because she has found favor with God. Now, not that God owes her a favor, but she has found favor with God. And here's what that means. Mary found favor, and well, she became the mother of Jesus. She was given a position of prominence. She was given a relationship with God through this baby Jesus. You know what? We've also found some favor with God. And it also gives us a relationship with God. One that is unlike any other relationship that you will ever experience. One that has the potential that if you live in it, will definitely relieve your fears because guess what? It protects. According to Psalm 5, 12. Surely, Lord, you bless the righteous. You surround them with your favor as with a shield. Living in this relationship with God gives you a shield from all those things that go around you, the storm that is circling. Not that we'll never know trouble. It's funny, when we call God our shield, remember, shields are made to carry into battle. They're not made to put on a shelf and look at. A shield is only good for protection when things are flying at you. But what God is saying, you will see trouble, you will know trouble, but I will protect you with this relationship because you have favor. 
It's eternal. God's favor is. Psalm chapter 30, verse 4 and 5 says, Sing the praises of the Lord. You, his faithful people, praise his holy name. For his, angels last only, for his anger lasts only a moment, but his favor lasts a lifetime. Weeping may stay for a night. Now, again, I take this back to the idea of a child because I'm sure we've all made our parents angry. Aren't you glad your parents aren't eternally angry? I know sometimes it feels like your parents are eternally angry, but they're not. And while we may do things that disappoint God, while we may do things that bring God's anger, it says that, you know what? That only lasts for a moment compared to his favor. His favor for you, his love for you, his desire for you, his favor will last a lifetime. You will never be able to overcome this relationship with God. Just because you don't always do things right doesn't mean God stopped loving you. No. It means that sometimes he might have to correct you, but his favor, it'll follow you all the way through your life. Man, that's a reason not to fear. Not only is it protect, not only is it eternal, you know what? This, this favor, it restores. Psalm 85, 1 says, You, Lord, showed favor to your land. You restored the fortunes of Jacob. By rejoicing comes, the rejoicing comes in the morning. It restores. God will restore you because he wishes to have a relationship with you. If you're going through a struggling time, if you're experiencing fear at this moment, just know that God has a restoration plan for your life. He has plans to fix it as it should be. We have no reason to fear. Because you know what? His favor, it shows compassion. Psalm 102 verse 13 says, You will arise and have compassion on Zion, for it's time to show favor to her. The appointed time has come. God looks at our lives and how messed up they get and how crammed they get and how overwhelmed we get and all those things. And you know what? He doesn't turn a blind eye. If you ever looked at Jesus' ministry, whenever he saw people struggling, what were the words that it says? And he had compassion upon them. God has compassion for our lives because we have found favor with God through a relationship with Jesus. And all of that is great. The fact that it protects, the fact that it's eternal, the fact that it restores, the fact that it shows compassion, all that is great. But then we get the cherry on top of the Sunday. Because you know what? This favor, according to Paul, it provides salvation. For he says, in the time of my favor, I heard you. And in that day of salvation, I helped you. I tell you now is the time of God's favor. Now is the day of of salvation. This idea that God has provided favor to you, it means a great deal to us. You know, when Mary found favor in the eyes of the Lord, her problems didn't end. In fact, they just started, didn't they? But I wonder what it felt like the first time she held baby Jesus. I think it was all worth it. I remember the first time I held both of my sons, and it was all worth it. I could not imagine have holding a baby that I knew was from God himself, God incarnate. I bet Mary thought, you know what? Let the troubles come. Because I have found favor with God and I have nothing to fear. And the fact that, that God hears our prayers and the fact that, that God has given us favor, well, there's another reason that we need to fear not. It's because God is at work. Back in the New Testament, just a little bit back from Luke, if you go back to Matthew, chapter 1, verse 20 and 21, we read, But after he, again, this is Gabriel on the scene, had considered, excuse me, this is Joseph on the scene, but after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will be the savior of his people, because he will save his people from their sins. 
You know, Joseph found out that Mary was pregnant, and Joseph knew it wasn't his. He began to wonder who Mary had cheated on him with. He became afraid. He was afraid for Mary because if he put her out publicly, then she would be stoned. What kind of feeling he was afraid for himself. I mean, what kind of man can't hang on, hang on to his wife? And I've got a feeling Joseph had many bad dreams since he found out that Mary was pregnant. But then this angel shows up in a dream. He says, you know what? All those fears you have, don't be afraid. Because God's at work in the middle of all of this. God has a plan, according to Jeremiah, chapter 29, verse 11. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not, har- not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. That's God at work in our life. God's not making this up as he goes along. It's not like you're going down the path and God's like, Dang, go on it, I didn't see that one coming. Let's make a new plan. God has a plan for your life. There's no reason that we need to fear. In fact, it says over in Philippians chapter, chapter five, 1, verses 5 and 6, because of your partnership in the gospel from this day until now, because of the confidence of this, that who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ. You see, God's going to finish what he starts. That's the way God works. It's not like God's going to start the renovation project and decide, you know what, this is a little more than I bargained for. I didn't realize I had that much work to do. I didn't realize I was going to have to get that many supplies to fix your life. Understand, God says, we're going to walk all the way to the end. I'm going to finish the plan if you allow me to. Now, again, if you've ever done a home renovation, there's absolutely nothing comfortable about it. There is absolutely nothing edifying by going in and looking at walls that have been torn down, cabinets that are in disarray, especially if you have OCD issues. Renovations are crazy time for you. You can't take it. We recently put a fireplace in our, in the, in our living room, and I want to tell you what, for those three days when they were there working on this, and it turned into a few weeks because they had to order some parts, I looked at that, and it about drove me crazy. But you know what? There was a picture in my head of what this was supposed to look like when it was done. I just had to learn to be a little patient and let the people that were doing the work do their job and stay out of their way. Sometimes our fear is getting God's way. We start giving God advice about where to put the nail. And we just need to understand he's doing the renovations. He's got the plan. He's got the design. And he's going to finish it. Let's go to another reason that we're not supposed to be afraid. And I think maybe this is the most important reason that you'll ever get. It's because God came down. Luke chapter 2, verses 10 through 11 say, And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel of the Lord said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will be of great joy to all the people. Wow. These, these angels showed up and, and they're going to give us some good news. And this is the good news. It says, today in the town of Bethlehem, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This is what the angel wanted to say. Now, again, I can imagine the shepherds sitting down on their hillside and probably shooting the breeze and discussing what's going on in their life and counting their sheep. How do you count sheep without falling asleep? How would you like to be a shepherd? Make sure you got them all in one, two. I don't see how that would work. But, but here they are. They're out there. They're taking care of their sheep. And all of a sudden, the night sky turns bright and an angel comes up. You know what? I think I'd be terrified too. I think I would get a little scared. But the first thing he says is, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. I'm not here to give you bad news. In fact, I am here to give you good news news. This is what Isaiah chapter 40 verse 9 says about that verse. 
You who bring good news to Zion, go up on a high mountain. You who bring good news to Jerusalem, lift up your voice and shout. Lift it up. Do not be afraid. Say to the towns of Judah, here is your God. What do you think the shepherds felt like when those words were rolling off of the tongues? The Messiah is here. God has come down to you. Now, I guess they could have sat there and said, you know what? Can you quote me a few scriptures here, angels? Can you give me a little theological proof? Can, can you tell me something? Can you, can you show me something? Do a trick for me to let me know this is really true? That's not what happened. They heard these good, this good news and their fear became great joy. Nehemiah chapter 8 verse 12 says, And all the people went away to eat and drink and send portions of the food to celebrate with great joy because now they understood the words that had been made known to them. These Shepherds, they were some joyous people. As a matter of fact, here's the funny thing. They forgot all about the sheep. I often wonder if they drew straws about who was going to have to stay behind to watch the sheep while the others went to check out the baby. Would, would you want to be the one left behind when an angel just showed up and said, the Messiah is here? I wonder if they just said, wolves, buffet, we're going to, we're going to Bethlehem. We have... Great joy that we have to do. We have to go and see this miracle that's happened. Their fear was all gone because God had come down. God was present and accounted for. And you know what? This good news wasn't just for the shepherds. It wasn't just for the people in Jerusalem. It wasn't just for the Israelites. It says it is good news for all people. This is what Psalm 145, verses 10 through 13 says. The Lord is good to all. He has compassion on all he has made. All your works praise you, Lord. Your faithful people extol you. They tell of your, the glory of your kingdom and speak of your might, so that all people may know that you are mighty, that of your mighty acts and your glorious splendor of your kingdom. Your kingdom is, ever, is an everlasting kingdom, and your dominion endures for all generations. This wasn't a message just for the shepherds. It was a shepherd. It was a message for everybody that was present on the earth that day and for all the generations to come. Don't be afraid. God has come down. Don't be afraid because the Lord is present. Put away your fears because God is here living with you today. What a message. Sometimes I think if I would take my, my fears and put them in that perspective that, you know what, are my fears any bigger than my God? That's a big point, isn't it? Do my fears live closer to me than my God? That's an even bigger point. You see, this was a message for all people. A Savior had been born. A way out. A method to end the fear. Somebody that was going to take control of my life. Somebody that was going to show me what it means to not have to live in the fear that I have been living all of my life in. It's Christmas pantophobia. The lack of fear about what life is going to throw at me. See, this message resonates because there isn't a person here that is truly pantophobic. I've never met somebody that is truly pantophobic that has no fear of something. We could probably sit here and tell horror stories about some of our fears. I'm not a big fan of ladders. I don't mind heights. Not going up a ladder to get there, though. Find another way to get me up there. I'm fine. Okay? I know people that are just terrified of spiders. My father-in-law is, is afraid of snakes, deathly afraid of snakes. Trust me, my mind has spun a few times about that idea. It, it, but all of us have fears in our life that we struggle with, and not just those kind of fears. We're, we're afraid that people are going to let us down. We're going to be afraid that we're going to be disappointed. Some of us are afraid that God's going to forget about us. You see, fear goes through all of our lives 
Isn't it funny that through the Christmas story, God kept having to tell people, don't be afraid. I got this. I hear your prayers. I know what you need. I've heard your requests. I get it. You found favor with me, and I'm going to work in your life. I'm going to be a part of your life because I'm not requiring you to come up to my standard. I came down to you. What a message for Christmas. Don't be afraid. We're going to go into a time of decision. I want you to think about this. You see, if I can cut my clicker back on, there we go. You see, a lot of us, we're afraid because we don't really understand what it means to have a relationship with Christ. And so this morning, if you're here and you've, you've never met the Savior, this person, this little baby that came down into the manger and, and grew up and gave his life on a cross, if you've never started that relationship, I imagine you're living with a lot of fear. Let me encourage you to come on down and I'll show you what it means to be a Christian. Of course, most of us are living with the other kind of fears that we're just not living up to God's measuring stick. Come on, doesn't that resonate with all of us? God has a standard and I don't live up to it, so I'm afraid what God might do to me. This message should tell you something about God's not interested in damaging your life. God is interested in living your life with you. So maybe it's during this time of decision that you begin to think about, what does it mean for me to live my life with Christ? Because I'm tired of being afraid. I'm tired of letting Satan get the best of me because I'm just in fear for my life. Maybe you need to come forward and pray. Maybe you need to sit there and pray. Maybe this is something you just need to pack up and take home with you and say, you know what? I need to think about what is it is that I put in front of God. What is it I'm afraid of? Would you please stand? We're going to pray. And then we're going to sing.